Great. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, I am Abraham Newman, and I am the director of the Mortara Center here at Georgetown University, uh, which you can see sparkling behind me, um, if only. Um, but we're so excited to host this event today. Um, let me just start by acknowledging that Georgetown University's success today uh, is a product in part of enslaved labor and the sale of enslaved people. Uh, you can learn more about Georgetown University's effort to understand and address its role in the injustices of slavery at uh, slavery.georgetown.edu. Um, so just to pan out a little bit, um, this event today is part of a larger project that is happening at Georgetown, um, which is the Global Political Economy Project. And uh, Kate McNamara, who maybe can wave in the background in her beautiful garden, which is real, unlike my uh, virtual garden, um, Kate McNamara and I, we started this project about 18 months ago, where we were interested and in kind of we feel like there needs to be an opening up of uh, what we think about in political economy and in particular putting people at the center of that project. Um, and so uh, this initiative has done a bunch of events. There was a year-long series on race and the international political economy. Uh, this project today uh, the GPEPQ is about qualitative methods, and it's actually the final event in a series of events that have been taking place over the last month, which with a number of uh, uh, PhD participants to really think about how we can improve uh, qualitative methods and their use in political economy more broadly. Uh, so today's discussion about publishing qualitative methods in political economy, we think it's, it's really an important piece in putting people back at the center of uh, global political economy research. And to uh, engage in that discussion, we have three amazing um, discussants for our roundtable today. So let me just briefly introduce each of them. Uh, then we'll have a, 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 about a half hour of kind of short presentations from each of them. And then we'll have a, a, a more free flowing discussion. I'm from the DC area, so we have Kojo Namdi, who's the kind of the local news uh, talk show at noon. And I'm hoping that we can get into that kind of space. Um, as we go through the conversation, if you have questions or comments, I invite you to put them into the chat. And hopefully you should be chatting me. I will be the person that will aggregate the comments and then we'll kind of do rounds of, of questions for the panelists. So. To get to the panelists, uh, let me just briefly introduce them. Um, Jackie Best is a professor in the School of Political Studies at the University of Ottawa. Um, for our conversation today, I just wanna also note, she is a co-editor of the Review of the International Political Economy, uh, which is an amazing journal that is published by Rutledge. James Morrison is an assistant professor in the Department of International Relations at the London School of economics and political science. Uh, he has a, a particular specialty in using history in political economy. Uh, finally, uh, we have Lena Mosley, who is a professor in the Department of, political, of Politics and the School for Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. Um, she is, was an associate editor at the American Journal of Political Science, one of the flagship uh, journals of the American Political Science Association. Um, and she also is, has a specialty in interview uh, techniques in political economy. Um, before I uh, move into our discussion, I just want to acknowledge the support that we have received from the Open Society Foundation and their program on economic justice, which has believed in our project and supported us and made this event and this series possible. Well, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our speakers. Um, I'm going to go in alphabetical order. So start with Jackie, uh, then James, and then Lena, unless they have pulled one on me and they've decided that there should be an alternative uh, menu of choice, which I'm also open to. But if that sounds right, then I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Jackie. Thanks again. And I just remind people, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and I will start uh, you know, making a, a kind of a, a, a list of questions. Thank you so much. I'm gonna just, I do have a very short PowerPoint presentation. 
Um, and I'm so delighted to be part of this and to be starting this conversation and also to be learning tips from the others because we're all still, you know, even those of us who've been around for a while figuring this out, publishing in IPE in qualitative methods. So I got to have, sort of start big and get to something a few more uh, rather sort of concrete uh, suggestions as, as I go. So I'm going to start off with this where to publish question, right, which is I think always a bit agonizing, right? Figuring out where does this 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 creation that I that I'm you know putting together, where do I go with it? Um, I want to start by acknowledging that part of you know part of that decision has to be realistic. <laughs> you know that we are all in different institutional contexts, we're at different stages of our careers. If you're a you know doctoral student, that you're making one set of decisions. Your full professor tenured somewhere, and different set of decisions. Um, and what country you're in and what kinds of publishing expectations there are on you. You know, if you're in the UK with the ref, whatever, these are all gonna be playing a role. Hopefully not the only role, but that's gonna be one of the first kind of questions you wanna be realistic about. Um, but then if you, if you can move beyond that, and I hope you can, right? The next question is really, who do you wanna to talk to? So journals are places for conversations, right? And, and I think it's very important as you're identifying what journal to, to pitch your piece to, to send your piece to, is think about who, who do I wanna be talking to? What are those conversations? What are the debates I wanna engage in? Um, and then I would suggest that you try as much as possible to think holistically. And I find this useful doing qualitative work in IPE in particular, because I think my projects, you know, whether it's a PhD project, it's big, right? Or in, in my case, it's often, I've got a grant and I'm asking a big set of research questions and then breaking that up into, okay, so this is a big project. I don't have to get all my pieces in the same journals, right? I can think strategically and IPE is interdisciplinary. And that means we can also think strategically by thinking, okay, maybe this piece of my work, my, my stuff has a tendency to have kind of a critical band. So, but some of my stuff is pretty conventional. So this piece of it can go in a journal, you know, this kind of journal and these other pieces, maybe I can stick something in a social theory journal um, in a global government, even you know, if you've got a, a project that has a global governance angle, you could think in those terms, something that's straight conventionally IPE, a comparative region, et cetera. So you can think of your, your projects and as, as a series of, of papers, of articles and of, of projects in that sense. Um, and then the other part of this thinking holistically or thinking sort of pragmatically is also thinking in, have a plan A, like this is, you know, if this is my journal that talks to say, I don't know, IR theory and brings an IPE perspective in, um, this is my plan A journal, but if it doesn't get in there, you know, I've got a plan B and I've got a plan C and it's not the end of the world. Um, I have, I, when I was doing stuff that had a global governance edge to it, I would, you know, it, sometimes I would just start with IO. I always got rejected, but it was a great place to start, right? And I would see what happened. They would give me feedback uh, really quickly. And then I would turn it around and send it somewhere else. So you, there's nothing wrong with thinking in those terms, right? Thinking big, but also thinking practically. Um, and then I think also think long term, at least occasionally. This doesn't mean every single time you're, you know, deciding where to publish something that you're going to agonize about, you know, your, your, I don't know, your legacy, right? But, but think about the fact. Think I had a professor once, a mentor, who gave me great advice, which is now and then sit down and think, where do I want to be in ten years? Who do I want to be talking to? I mean, yes, I want a job, but beyond that, right? What kind of a scholar do I want to be? Because academic publishing takes a long time, right? So what you're working on now is going to build communities, build networks, get you invitations. And there's a kind of path dependency about that. So thinking a bit about that, I think can also be useful. And it also means, you know, maybe right now I like when I came off mat leave, I was like, I just need to publish something somewhere because you know I only have half a brain. Um, and then at other times in my life, I'm like, no, I can really work this into something like an aim for a journal I really want to get into, or you know, start talking to some new people or whatever. So think about that. And it may also be like that's also a way of taking some of the immediate pressure off and thinking, well, maybe in 10 years I want to be pitched to like. A policy community, or I want to be a public intellectual. But right now, I just need tenure. You know, so I'm going to publish the, the places that will make that possible. Okay. So first, where so where to publish? Then how to get your article ready? Okay. And this is me switching hats a bit and thinking about it as 
uh, someone who was, I'm not actually one of the editors of Ripe anymore, but was for three years until a year ago, right? So this is what, what coming, looking at it from the angle of the editor reading um, the work. Um, and number one would just be, don't make it hard for the reader to figure out why your findings matter. Make it real, make the who cares really, really obvious. Um, I think that's particularly important for the sort of qualitative or interpretive research where it's not going to always be, you know, the, the data is rich, it's thick, it's nuanced. So tell us why we should care and make it really clear in the abstract, even in the, even work on that title, right? Get that title really clear, get those keywords really clear, and then get that introduction, bang it into shape. And like, this is the literature I'm engaging with. These are the empirical contributions. These are the theoretical innovations, bang. Um, and, and do make sure then, because again, with qualitative data, it's nuanced, right? Part of its beauty is it's contextual, it's rich, it's complex, right? But then we get lost in that. You know, even having done this for, for 20 years now, you get, I get lost, you know, go to the archives and I'm like, oh my God, there's like a hundred stories I could tell. So pick one <laughs> or maybe two, you know, but make it really clear. And an article in particular, if you're gonna write a book, we can talk about that, but you know, that's a different, you can, you can take your time. If you're writing an article, it's gotta be short and sweet literature, few key, you know, data and why this matters and you need to make it as clear as possible. Um, and then do use strong language to articulate the paper's significance. Um, and I think this is partly a gender problem, right? That we, and there's literature on this, literature both showing if you make strong claims, you get accepted more easily, you get cited more, but also that, you know, that some, with some of us, maybe this might be a little bit important because you no know, try to avoid that don't over promise right don't say i've changed the world and this is going to change everything but try to also be really clear and maybe talk it over with a colleague okay these are the three you know I, this is these are the main things i think i'm saying and finally don't aim for perfection okay now this is a hard one but just this is a colleague who told me this and it's great advice right just get it good enough for a revise and resubmit almost nothing ever gets accepted conditionally, right? You just need to, to get a bounce back. So you know then who read it, well, you don't, you don't know who read it, but you know what their priorities are and you can get it into shape for those reviewers. Okay, so at a certain point, you gotta let it go. That's a hard, that's an art, but it's one worth working on. Okay, last slide. How do you respond to reviews? Okay, first remember an R&R, &R, even one that makes you cry <laughs> is still a great achievement. And yes, I cry a lot when I get my r and Rs. And then you put it away and you don't look at it for a couple of weeks and then you come back to it and you go, oh, you know what? They have a point, okay? So let it sit, come back. And then do take time at that point to synthesize the reviews, right? So to figure out what are the big takeaways from these reviews and then to, you know, so that you can respond carefully and in good faith. Because you, you know, to get to the next stage, you need to do that. You need to show you've actually engaged with them. That doesn't mean you need to answer every single point, right? You can gloss over some things, you can, but you need to make sure you do the basics. Okay. And another point I think that I think is a worth point, a good editor is gonna give you a steer. They're gonna say, you know, pay attention to R1 on this, but our emphasis is on R2 and this. Maybe we won't even send it to R3, but you may not get that direction sometimes. Okay, so if you if you feel like the reviews are pushing you in different directions, and again, I think this happens with qualitative and interpretive work because there is so much there. People are like, oh, I want to I want to push you in this direction or in this direction, and they may not agree, right? So if you get to a point where there's a real problem, you can go back judiciously once, maybe, right, to the editors and say, okay, I, there's a tension here. This is how I propose to go through it. What do you is this okay? Uh, I think that can be very helpful in giving your, you know, giving your, yourself the kind of freedom to move ahead the way that you think makes sense and get some feedback at that point. Um, the other point is, so, so take the reviews seriously, do the work, but don't over revise. And this is a hard one. This is my major failing. I, I, I go through a process where I get the reviews and I'm like, oh my God, they're awful, they're terrible, they're mean. And then I come back to them like a few weeks later and I think, oh my God, they're right. This is a terrible piece of crap I've written and I tear it apart, right? And I start over practically and this is a terrible idea. And I think I get it because I do theory stuff. And so it's always possible to rethink. Um, and it often, you know, yes, the final product's better but it's also hugely costly and it doesn't always work. My first 
article that I sent out as a PhD student, got an R and R. I tore it to pieces. I put it back together, and then they looked at it and said, "We don't like it anymore." And I and then I didn't send it back out. I gave up on it, which I think is really sad. Okay, so don't over revise. And on the rejection, don't despair. Okay. So if possible, don't do what I do and then just not publish for a long time, right? Just take it, plan B, plan C, right? Keep going and uh, until you've really exhausted yourself. Um, just, you know, it, it's, a, it's a process and, and don't despair. I'll leave it there. Great, thanks, Jackie. I'm gonna turn it over now to James. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Abe and Kate, for having me. And thank you all for coming to this discussion. Um, but prior to this, the other two presenters and I coordinated. And this was very fortunate for me because I have two extremely esteemed uh, co-presenters. And so I've tried to arrange my remarks to complement the remarks that Jackie has just given and that um, we'll hear from uh, Lena just after me. I'll make a couple broad points here. The, the first one is that you should spend a lot of time and effort to try to consciously build your identity. This is your brand. And in our game, a lot of who you are is what you do and how you do it, like it or not. Now, it's important, I think, to reflect on this self-consciously. And Jackie's point about who you want to be in 10 years, what conversations you want to be in, is immensely good advice. There's been a trend in the academy in recent years, and I think I understand why it happens, and I don't criticize anybody for doing it, but I think twice before you jump on this bandwagon, and that's having a website that has two paragraphs. The first one says, I work on X, Y, Z, and the second paragraph says, my work has been published in journal A, journal B, journal C, and so on. Now, the trouble here, I think, is, is several fold. First, if the journals are general interest journals, that's great, but it doesn't really give an indication of the substance of the pieces. If the journal is a general interest journal, it is an indication of the quality, but a, a rather rough one. And it also crucially flattens your identity. You wanna train people to think about who you are and what you're saying and what you're doing rather than the series of boxes that you've ticked. Now, I understand deans, maybe lazy colleagues, want you to go out there and tick those boxes and satisfy those constraints. And I understand that we all face these kinds of practical constraints. But try not to lose sight, as I think Jacqueline reminded us, of the big things that really move you, who you want to be when you grow up as a scholar in the field. Remember that that's what your work is really ultimately all about. Now, part of your brand is the quality as well. And that's my second point, to try to pursue a quality-oriented strategy. Now, as I go on, I always talk to uh, more senior scholars in the field and try to get their perspective on things, of course. It's a wonderful way to get good advice. And I'm always, well, I'm less and less surprised, but initially I was very surprised that they always seem to emphasize the importance of doing high-quality work, quality over quantity. And these days, I really think, I say with confidence, that most people I know prefer quality over quantity. I don't meet anybody who ever says, boy, I wish that scholar out there would publish some more second rate work that I could read and review. It just doesn't happen. Much of the time, maybe I'm a bit idealistic, but I think a lot, you'll be judged by your best work. People will say, what is this person capable of achieving? And they'll try to figure out what your high end range is and hope that if you take the job, or if they bring you into the project, you'll be able to meet or exceed that expectation. And I know that that's an optimistic view, but I do see it quite a bit uh, in the field of IPE, people invested in each other, believing in them and trying to help other people achieve their, their great work. Also remember that a lot of times, because time is so scarce, people might only read a small sample of the work you do, one or two pieces. And you can make sure that they read good ones by pursuing a quality over quantity type strategy. So across your projects, try to build your identity, your contribution, brick by brick, piece by piece. Within a specific piece, try to have a relentless focus on your main thrust. Now, this is really tough because you want to have a really ambitious punchline, as, as Jackie suggested. But at the same time, that requires doing a lot of ancillary type work, developing counterfactuals, considering potential alternative explanations, and so on. 
So you want to do everything you need to do, but not a lot more than that. Now, ideally, you'll be able to engage other discussions, other literatures along the way. But again, this is quite different from the advice sometimes people get of publishing the minimal publishable unit. This is more like the maximal publishable unit. How much can you do with 12,000 words in a journal? You want one big idea with many clear implications, not a thousand different ideas that are sort of loosely related. In general, I'll echo what Jackie said. Qualitative work is hard to do. It's hard to fit into a journal. It's hard to fit into a 12 minute IPES presentation. Make no mistake. But you always wanna to try to overshoot rather than undershoot. You did all that field work. You gathered all those interviews. You went to the archives. Don't mess it up by uh, missing the potential of your project by submitting it when it's not really ready yet, when you haven't really worked it all out. It takes so long to do the kinds of work we do, so give yourself the opportunity to be as successful with it as you can be. Hopefully, over time, you'll develop a reputation that when you send something out or when you publish something, people will believe it is worth reading, worth their time. You'll surprise and delight them. Okay, my third point is to reflect actively on the nature of your undertaking, particularly the level of prior consideration. And this is a bit more practical. Some of the topics we look at haven't really been considered much before. Abe started out with the really important point about the people who have contributed to what we do who often have been nameless in the past. So if you're doing work on cutting edge topics, marginalized voices, or an ethnographic study of a group of people who haven't been considered before, the good news is everything you say will be new, but it'll be very hard perhaps to connect it to all the other conversations that have been happening. So there's a positive, but there's also a negative. There's a constraint, but there's also an opportunity. On the other side, if you write about Abraham Lincoln on slavery, great news, there's a massive audience. Bad news, it'll be really hard to find something new to say about Abraham Lincoln on slavery. So with each of these types of topics, be honest with yourself about whether you are doing something on the frontier that you'll have to try to connect to where people are today versus if you're going where people already are and trying to come up with something new, the constraints and opportunities will indeed be different. Okay, my last substantive point, how do you know when to send something out? Jackie's advice is great. I would say the threshold is don't be demonstrably wrong. Don't be demonstrably wrong. Meaning, in terms of your empirics, you don't want to send something out where people can say, but what about the such and such evidence? I do historical work, so if I write something about Churchill, I need to make sure that there isn't some body of scholarship or evidence that says that my interpretation of Churchill on some key point is wrong. Same thing might be if you're doing interviews of central bankers or investors or whomever else. As a theoretical matter, this one's even more tricky. If you're finding clashes with what everybody thinks they know about a standard case, the origins of the First World War, or how things worked out in the Cuban Missile Crisis, this is a great opportunity, but it is a challenge. Because you've got to explain to your readers and reviewers why your new interpretation of the First Iraq War, which happens to fly in the face of the Cuban Missile Crisis standard textbook interpretation, why you're right and everybody else is wrong. It's a challenge but it's also an opportunity. You don't want reviewers to say, what about this such and such as a theoretical or an empirical matter? So one of the things that separates good work from really good work is that really good work considers and preempts potential counter arguments. And one of the ways you come to know that is by sharing it with colleagues in advance. Present it, get people to read it, and you can get good people to give good feedback by giving good feedback to good people now. And uh, that's how the field moves forward. So in conclusion, a couple key points. One, maximize the potential of your projects. A thousand no's for every yes, as Steve Jobs used to say. Develop something really good, put your weight behind that, make a sig significant contribution. I don't think you'll be sorry if you do that. Second, tomorrow's promise to no one. Do the best and most important work you have on your desk right now. My biggest regrets have come from leaving potential on the table or from trying to catch a wave or a fad 
or trying to fit something into somebody else's timeline. I know we have these kind of constraints, but insofar as you can be true to the work and the projects you believe you need to do, I think you'll be a much more satisfied scholar. And I think that you'll be able to do more of the kind of work you wanna do and make the kind of contribution that you wanna make in the long run. So thank you all very much. I look forward to the questions. Wonderful. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over now to Lena. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Abe, um, and and thanks to to you and Kate both for uh, for organizing this roundtable, uh, and to Jackie and James for uh, for such great advice. So I'll try to add in some things that are that are helpful. Um, and so I, I, I should say that you know I I'm someone who's um, used qualitative methods uh, in terms of interviews as well as with less um, archives, uh, and has often done so in a in a multi method context, uh, and has published. Um, Books and, and and journal articles, and I would say more recently, sort of focused on the on the journal side of um, of that. Um, and so I have sort of I guess kind of four uh, sort of broad categories of of, um, of advice. Um, the first one is to um, to think carefully as you begin to get to that final version of your uh, of your manuscript about where you're going to submit your paper. Uh, and obviously, we we often think about this question in terms of like, well, you know, is the word limit eleven thousand words, or is it fourteen thousand words, uh, or how long of a data appendix am I allowed? Uh, but there's there's a kind of more substantive reason to think about this as well. That is to say, um, making sure that you are engaging with and and citing. Um, work that the journal has published. And I'm going to come back to what journals published in a second. Um, but, um, but, but to sort of kind of make sure that you are in conversation um, with the journal substantive content and, uh, and probably with the reviewers that, uh, that you're going to, uh, to get. Uh, and as Jackie reminds us, part of this is, is, is paying attention even to your abstract, right? It's not that many words, um, but it's going to matter when reviewers are asked to review their paper, your paper. So make sure that your argument and your method um, are clear right there in the abstract. Um, but even uh, beyond that, in the first few pages of your paper, uh, make sure that you're signaling very early in the paper uh, the conversations and debates and questions uh, that your paper is engaging. Uh, a little little trick that I didn't learn until, uh, to, until much too late is that um, when journal editors or editorial assistants or managing editors get your paper, uh, they are trying to figure out to whom to send it as reviewers. And for all but the most specialized journals, um, many times they're not going to be experts in your little piece of, um, of, of international political economy. And so uh, these well-intentioned and overworked editors and editorial assistants are figuring, okay, to whom should I send this? Uh, and and one, one thing they're doing is like, well, who do I know who works on X? But they're also going to be looking at your paper and, and sort of those first few pages and saying, who, who, who cited in this paper? Right, so I don't want to say you should be like super strategic and cite irrelevant stuff because you think those are nice people, even though their work is irrelevant to your paper. Uh, but I am suggesting that you that you think a little carefully about sort of what you're signaling um, about where this paper kind of fits into that broader academic conversation, and in doing so, you make it a little bit easier on um, on editors and uh, and editorial assistants. Um, the second thing I, I want to mention, and this in some ways contradicts what I've just said a little bit, is that. While you want to think about the substantive fit between your submission and the journal that you're uh, that you're targeting, uh, I think it's also important to remember that journals are only able to publish uh, what is submitted to them. So sometimes you'll hear, hear people say, "Well, um, this journal doesn't publish work on this topic," or "This journal doesn't publish qualitative work." Um, and, and maybe it's true that the journal's editors or the reviewer pool don't tend to like certain kinds of work or they're biased in favor of other kinds of work. Um, but I will say that you shouldn't assume that just because you haven't seen a certain thing in a journal's pages uh, in recent years that they're hostile to the work. Right. And so I think that sometimes there can be a kind of vicious circle here in terms of, hey, this journal doesn't publish work on the environment. But if that's true and no one sends that journal work on the environment, they really can't publish work on the environment. So um, so don't be afraid sometimes um, to think about um, where to where to send that and to send to a place that hasn't necessarily published something with your method or with your um, with your substance. Uh, and then, of course, as, as Jackie's as already suggested, there are lots of choices one could make about sending your international political economy focused research, whether you want to send it to a general interest journal, to an IR focused journal, to a more IPE focused journal, 
or to a journal that's kind of um, CPE or comparative politics, but many of those will publish work that is that is IPE since that dividing line is, uh, is often quite fuzzy. Uh, and then of course, you also might think about a journal that's more interdisciplinary in its focus. Um, so if you're thinking about something like regulation and governance or review of international organizations or economics and politics, you wanna keep in mind uh, that you might need to think a little bit more about framing your argument to fit the journal's readership, right? So if you're gonna send something to a journal that has an interdisciplinary editorial team, you might wanna think about, for instance, well, what are the sociologists saying about uh, global supply chains and labor rights, right? I can't just be speaking to the political scientists. Okay, um, third, third thing to, to think about is um, with respect to qualitative methods, is that you shouldn't apologize for your methods, right? So I think sometimes there's a little bit of like qualitative method insecurity that, that happens. Um, you certainly should talk about your methods and you certainly should tell the, um, your readers and your reviewers um, why you've made the methodological choices you have, right? So why is this the best way to come at this question given my question? Uh, why, is it, why is an interview-based approach best um, either on its own or in conjunction with other approaches? Uh, why should we go to the archives? What do we gain, right, uh, by by doing it this way uh, versus doing it some other way? Um, I think it's important to be transparent um, about your method. So that is, for instance, um, how did you choose those folks that you interviewed? Uh, who did you try to get and who did you not get? Uh, if you used a sort of semi-structured interview guide, what did that look like? Uh, if you used archives, are there limits in terms of what kinds of archival materials are available given the time frame, or to which government's archives you had access? Uh, and I think also increasingly uh, to talk about um, what sorts of ethical questions you confronted in doing your work and how you, how you resolve them. So that's something that we're seeing, I think, increasingly um, as, for instance, the um, American Political Science Association has now revised its... Uh, its principles around human subjects research. We also see journals um, wanting people to discuss whether it's whether it's work that involves uh, field experiments or interviews, kind of what some of the ethical considerations um, are. Uh, and related as well to, to methods, um, for some material and especially for journals that have short word limits, uh, the data appendix can be your friend, right? So reviewers are not going to want to read a hundred page appendix. Uh, and many times journal editors won't, won't send it out. Uh, so you don't want to do that. Uh, but that being said, uh, you also might think about, for instance, um, including a case or two in detail in the body of your article, but maybe summarizing some of your other case materials in a table and giving more information about those additional cases in an, in an appendix. Uh, technology has made this kind of easier and easier to do. And so you can think as well about um, depositing uh, your sort of qualitative method uh, materials at QDR uh, to sort of make it easier for readers to kind of go back um, if they're interested and sort of know what you did. Um, and then my final point is uh, something that echoes something that, uh, that both uh, James and Jackie mentioned, which is that um, for better or worse, rejection is, is part of our profession. So we have a little bit of like survivor bias where we all sit up here that we've, we've been fine and tell you how to do it. Um, long ago, uh, and it was so long ago that this involved mailing some paper. So long ago, I sent an article that was based on my dissertation that was based largely um, on interviews to a journal. Uh, and it was my first time sending anything. I was, I was near the end of graduate school because back in those days, you could actually like get a job without, without a publication. Um, and I sent this out and, um, and it got an R&R. &R. Uh, and I didn't know how lucky I was. Maybe I failed to appreciate that at the time. Um, but in any case, it did. It landed at the journal, uh, and it took me uh, 21 years uh, until about like two months ago to land another article at that same journal, right? So, uh, so you know, it's 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 not always easy. Um, and a lot of my papers that ended up uh, somewhere went to two or three or four places before they landed. So, um, Bob uh, Bob Cohane, who was one of my dissertation advisors. Um, told us long ago in grad school that you know, published work is the very final version of, of a building. But there's a lot of work, there's a lot of scaffolding, there's often a lot of demolition and a lot of rebuilding uh, before it gets to that stage. So don't expect that you're gonna write the final version, uh, whatever that means, uh, on, on your first try or even necessarily as your first submission. This kind of echoes this idea that don't hold on for, um, for perfection. But I think it also means that um, 
in the best circumstances, you're going to learn a lot from the review process itself. So someone else, one of the other faculty members uh, who taught me in graduate school said that um, he never aimed for this sort of, you know, the, the, the highest spot on his first submission of an article uh, because it's so rare to get in. And, you, and, and, and his take was that you would get feedback in the review process uh, and improve it on the first round. And you'd wanna send that even better version, right? To the aim high place. Now, I don't always follow that, but I think it's an interesting thing to think about. And I think it also reminds us uh, that on the other side of the publishing process, um, that we have a responsibility um, as reviewers to say yes to some of those review requests, maybe not all of them, uh, and also to really give um, the most constructive feedback that, uh, that we can. And I'll leave it there. Thanks. Wonderful. I think all three of the presentations really raised um, a, a ton of, of ideas and thoughts about how to engage in uh, publishing qualitative research and the, both the barriers and the constraints. I, I just want to pull out a few things that I heard um, just to kind of summarize. One of them um, that I, I believe very strongly in is the idea that we are part of intellectual communities engaged in conversations. And the whole idea is to have debates in which people argue with each other. And that often we forget about that. And then what happens is, is we give up on things, you know, like there was a paper, somebody said, oh, I didn't agree with you. And then, you know, then you're like, oh, well, then I'm just going to shove that in a drawer. But the whole point of the activity is to engage in debates and conversations with other people. And so I just, I think several of the speakers raised this question or, or, or emphasized the need to just keep going. Don't give up on yourself uh, and engage in that debate. Um, similarly, I think it's important, and this was uh, several people raised this point of that, that actually the journals, they have their own communities. And it kind of ties into that, that we're engaged in these intellectual conversations, that they're with communities who are thinking about certain ideas. And so it's important to think about how your research and the way you're approaching it from qualitative methods, perhaps, fits into the conversations that are happening in that community. So uh, for a while, I was the editor of ISQ. And you know it has its own group of people that are involved in that community. It's not the same as IO or RIPE. And so you know people, in a very strategic logic, it's like, who do I cite? But I think it's a much broader kind of issue, and this is what Lena was talking about, of like that the, you're framing it for the conversation that's happening in that that space in that intellectual community that's embodied by the journal. And so if we can, you know, think about, it also answers that question of like, well, maybe the journal won't accept my thing because they don't do this thing. Well, it's like, because you have to pitch the conversation to them and show them the value. What are they missing? What's that nugget that they're not getting without your contribution? Um, and so I just wanted to, I just wanted to stress the kind of like, don't, don't hide your thoughts because if you're not engaging in the conversation, then we're not really, you know, we'll never advance. We'll never get that conversation going because you're holding it back. Um, and also really think about who is the group, who's the, who's the community that um, these conversations are happening in. Okay, with that being said, I wanted to turn now with some next wave questions for the group. Um, the first is, I think it's, it's kind of like, um, I'm going to call them nuts and bolts tips about what you do in your paper to make your qualitative research sing for a journal audience. And I'll just give two examples of things that I, I always look for when I read a qualitative paper. Um, the first is, is the narrative structure, is it organized analytically? So a lot of times I'll get a qualitative paper if I'm an editor or if I'm, you know, just reviewing something and it's organized chronologically. And that might be, that might be okay. But for me, I'm often thinking, well, this paper would be better suited if it was structured around the key ideas of the piece. And this was kind of what James was saying. I was like, have your main argument that sings, then the, the narrative, maybe it has a background section, but then it should have these kinds of organized around the key ideas. Okay, another thing that I often find very persuasive 
is when they're, I'll call it a process tracing table, but you might call it something else, but it's like, here's my argument, here's the competitor argument, here's what the theory expects and here's what I found in my qualitative research and it's just a quick summary of like you know me versus the the alternative and what was the evidence what does it say so those are kind of two of these but I would like to hear other like if we could collect you know like what what is that thing that you do that you think gets your paper into the the you know the higher level journal or what's something when you read it in a in a piece you're like bam that is, you know, that puts this piece in a different category of qualitative research than maybe your average piece. So I'm gonna go uh, lightning round with people responding to that. Uh, maybe, I don't know, I'll just go in reverse order. Is that okay, Lana? Sure. Okay. Um, I, although I, one of my answers would be to echo um, yours in terms of this kind of process tracing. So, so I, I, I tend to think about this as like, show me a picture. Right. And often when we do qualitative work, it's like, oh, it doesn't have those tables. It doesn't always have those tables and figures, right, that we see in, in quant work. Um, but it's really nice to see, like, what's the causal process that I think is occurring here? Right. And then what are we in? What's the competing uh, set of claims? And then how can my evidence help me to adjudicate between these processes? Um, and so it, all, it breaks up the text. Right. But it's also more important than that. And I actually think that that's a, a, that's good advice for when you're formulating um, a project as well. Um, I also, when I'm looking at work that involves um, interview, interview evidence, um, I do like that table that sort of shows me, you know, not, you know, I, I don't, there are reasons for, of, of sort for a sort of confidentiality or anonymity even, right, but just giving some sense of um, the types of people interview, the number of interviews done, sort of what that, what that looks like uh, is, is also um, useful to see. Is it me? It is you. All right. So uh, I have two things. One is very simple, and one uh, speaks to what you were talking about, Abe. So the first one, which is really simple, my first article, I really didn't know what structure to give it. So I literally took the Steve Krasner piece, uh, State Power and Structural World Markets, that I was talking to and copied the structure because it's a fantastic structure. And I, I put my bits around sort of the scaffolding uh, that, that he had, and it really helped me figure out what I needed to put in and, and what I needed to leave out. That leads to the second point, which is that this, I, I, I don't wanna uh, ruffle any feathers. I'll give an extreme version, right? Here's the extreme version. Historians know everything, but don't understand anything. And social scientists understand things, but don't know anything. And that's, you know, the extreme version is not really true, but thinking that way reminded me that historians place a huge amount of emphasis on complexity and the richness, but they don't think about relative causal weight. Whereas someone like Abe Newman or Kate McNamara, they're reading these things, they're a reviewer, they don't need to know all the different circumstantial bits, the way a historical, sorry, his crowd of historians might want to know, they really want to make sure that your evidence lines up with the causal story, the analysis that you're giving. And so a very, th that's a broader point. Here, the practical advice is write double what you think the journal will publish and then compress and cut and trim and reshape to get it down to where it needs to be. And the same thing for an IPES presentation, 12 minutes, very hard to do qualitative presentations, write a 25 minute talk and then figure out how you can get it down to the absolute essentials. Far easier to go in that direction than to start with something small and, and, and try to bulk it up. Thanks, These are Tina. awesome ideas and suggestions. And uh, I very much like certainly Abe's point on the analytic structure. I would, I also am always telling my PhD students that, right? It's like, give me like just, you know, I don't want a ch chapter case, case, case. I want like conceptual. If you can, if you can't, that's okay. But if you can do it, it means you're mobilizing that analysis all the way through. Um, and in terms of structure, I mean, one thing I would say is also just look at, because I do publish in a pretty wide range of journals. We can talk about the pros and cons of that uh, strategy. It stops me from being bored, but it does also mean, you know, 
I, I don't have a citation cartel built up, I'm afraid. So like there's, there's there are strategic disadvantages, but it does mean that like the model of the structure is gonna be very different depending on the type of journal. Um, just even how it's laid out and if there's a separate method section discussion or if it's you know really narrative, like just, so pay attention to that. And I think in IPE, we're interdisciplinary, right? So in theory, you can publish in quite a range of different um, types of journals, but be aware that the conventions are going to be different. So there's different conversations and there's also different conventions. Um, and my only other point would be one of the things, it's just a trick I like doing, but I also like it in what I read, which is again, partly because I do quite theoretically driven work often is that yes, it's partly about the new data, but it's also, does the new data give me a new set of conceptual categories? Right? So, I mean, one of the things I've found interesting is shifting. I do from interviews to archives, you just see different things, right? You see the messiness in archives. If you do interviews, you, you hear the narrative that people are telling you. And if you see the messiness that then generates, I, I'm suddenly interested in like ignorance and, you know, and, and things that, that, that appear when you see the met, you know, th that nature of the data. So you can also, it means you can actually tell, you can bring different conversations, different concepts um, into the conversation out of the data, but also by drawing on different um, theoretical you know, fields, disciplines, and so on. So I think that can also be a useful, like, here's this field, here are the set of, but if I bring this new concept in, you know, how does that change? And how does that then help me understand what went on in the, at that particular time or in that context better than existing explanations? Great. Um, I want to just ping people. If you have questions, um, please put them in the chat and I will kind of organize them into uh, tiers of questions for our group. Um, we have a bunch of great questions that have already come in. And so I'm just going to uh, toss a bunch your way and feel free, you know, uh, speakers, you know, it's like, choose the ones you want to answer, you know, the ones where you want to even, it's like, I, I give it up to your discretion on how to, um, to think about them. So um, one of the questions is about, uh, I would call it momentum while doing qualitative research which is the ebbs and flows of your excitement for a project. And I think we all know, you know, this is, you know, any project could be a six to 10 year endeavor. And a lot of graduate students are in that beginning, let's say two years, and you thought you were gonna go out there and you're so excited and maybe you love doing the interviews and then you just are stuck. And so any kind of like stories of, you know, what are your tricks to get out of bed and get back into the research, I think would be um, very valuable. The second one is, I think it's, um, it, it unpacks this question of how do you justify your methods? Um, because I think that there was a moment where uh, when KKV, the, that book, the Co King, Cohen and Burba, you know, when they came out and they said, well, this is how you justify your methods. You pretend you're a, quali you're a quantitative methodologist. Like pretend you're a quantitative methodologist and just explain how you are one with your qualitative methods. And I, I think that that is certainly one template of how to do it, but I'd be interested to hear other templates or even the, I think the limits of that strategy um, in justifying what you're doing. Um, and then the final one that I'm gonna put into this round is um, tips about breaking your book length project into um, substantive articles with qualitative methods. So you've written, you've written your dissertation or you've written a book length project and you're trying to figure out how do you transform that into a 10,000 word um, intervention? So um, those are three very different questions and you can address all of them or one of them or whatever you would like, um, but I'm throwing them your way. And maybe this time I'm going to pick the center square, which is James, and then I will go Jackie and then Lena. I'm just crazy here. I'm just changing it up. Go James. Okay, so those are fantastic questions. Uh, thank you, Abe. Thank you, audience, for, for posing these. Uh, a couple, a couple thoughts. One on the book length thing. I think. Sometimes people are a little bit overly strategic and undercut their own, their own potential by saving the best stuff for the book and trying to spin some other things out first. Um, I don't have a particularly long CV, but 
I took the opportunities I had to try to publish the best thing I had at the time. And I uh, have really been pleased with that because I learned a lot in that process. And so then I did an article on the Great Depression and then I came back and the way I saw the book changed as a result of the process of publishing that. If I tried to save it somehow or spin something off smaller, it wouldn't have gotten the same level of, of, of analysis, discussion or feedback. In terms of trying to, to, to get out of bed and, and do the work, it is very difficult to develop that kind of momentum. And there, sometimes I think we overstate the differences between good qualitative work and good quantitative work. People who build data sets know well the experience of going into archives. Archival work doesn't just mean qualitative work. Um, and so people who do at least the kind of work that I do, I know there are different phases or seasons. There's the data collection phase, which might last a very long time when you're kind of running and gunning in the archive, getting everything you can, chasing leads, lightly looking at things, but you're just absorbing as much as you can. Uh, then there's a period of organization, and then there's a period of analysis, and then writing and revision. And these things might be spaced out with months in between them and so on. So I'll say two very simple things. The first thing is try to forgive yourself when you're in one phase for not doing one of the other phases. You can only do one thing at a time. If you're collecting, you're collecting. You need to collect. If you're writing, you're writing. Don't beat yourself up for not collecting. The second thing I will say is that because of the time that, can, that it can take to do this kind of work, it's really important to be organized and take notes and write things down as you go be organized about the archival materials so that you don't lose track of them 18 months later when you're trying to figure out you know, where the hell was this one from? Uh, why did I for, you know, capture this source and not that source? Thanks, James. Okay. Jackie. Yes, so again, excellent questions. Um, I, I, it's funny, so I agree with James, but I'm also gonna maybe not fully agree. So there we go, academic uh, engagement, which is that, I prefer not to just collect and then write because I just, it drives me crazy. I also, the last time I wrote a full outline and then wrote the whole thing was my MA thesis and it almost killed me. And after that, I decided I would write in a way that was also more fluid. Like I would kind of have an idea, but it would be a work in progress. And it's safe, it's probably slower, but it saved my, you know, my mental health. I find the same thing with, with research that I think with qualitative research, we go so deep, like we're doing interviews, you're doing archives, and you can get to the point with the archives, you're just taking photos of everything, right? <laughs> and you just have a whole bunch of photos, or you're just t taping the interviews, and you don't know what's in them, right? So my experience is to keep like layering those other, to keep the process iterative, do these short, shorter trips to collect, and then to process, and in the archives, or doing the interviews, which used to be often in Washington, right? It'd be seen, dude, go to the IMF, the World Bank, I come back in my hotel room, and I would first make sure that my handwritten notes were legible and then write notes on the notes and then write notes at the end of each trip to say, these were the five big, 10 big themes. And then I go back to them and I use them. For me, that keeps like my brain is working and I'm actually like, so I'm constantly kind of moving between the empirics and the theory. And for me anyway, cause I love think that the analytic stuff it's, it's, it's useful and it, it stops, it gets me out of bed. Let's just say that it makes it more interesting. So that would be my really concrete um, advice. Um, and then just on the how to justify methods, um, I think, again, we just see different things, right? And, and for me, like I said, the example of interviews versus archives, right? That is very interesting. You're seeing different aspects of the policy process. So I'm doing policy interviews, right? And so you're capturing different things that you're going to be in that context. Um, and also on the how, I'm, re I'm reminded of when um, Bob Cohen actually came and gave a talk and talked to our grad students a number of years ago and was encouraging them all to have really good explanatory questions, right? But then he also admitted, he gave his talk on contested multilateralism, and he admitted that that, that was actually a project that was all about the how and had no why. Like it didn't actually say why you would end up with it on, under what circumstances. So it's a very rich way. It's a good way, a fast, fantastic way of thinking about a set of practices and dynamics in global politics, but without necessarily having a clean causal set of claims to make. And I think, you know, even, you know, if even Cohen can do, we'll do that sometimes, right? It's okay sometimes to come up with a really strong paper that, or book, right? Or project that's really about how things work in politics. 
Okay, I guess it's my turn. Um, so uh, let me let me pick up where uh, where Jackie was, which uh, is kind of you know Abe's question around um, how do you how do you make a case for your for your qualitative uh, methods, right? And and you're right. I mean, Abe, we could certainly sort of go back on this sort of well, here's the logic of case selection, for instance, right, and process tracing that kind of is is analogous to the way that a quantitatively focused scholar might do it. Um, but I think that a lot of the work that we see now using qualitative methods uh, is instead this kind of well, what don't what 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 don't we know or what can't we know uh, from observational quantitative data or from field experiments or from text analysis, right? Like where you know what's the what's the kind of comparative advantage of qualitative methods? Um, so I think there's a you know there's a there's a, a set of things that we can say that. Um, we, we just can't figure out the causal mechanism, right? Unless we have uh, interviews or we have the sort of the archival record, right? And so to the extent that we wanna know something about process, uh, we either to inform, you know, other kinds of modeling or to inform explanation, uh, then those interviews or those archival materials are really, are really useful. Uh, I think there's also an argument now that, you know, because there is so much information, uh, there are sort of political actors have incentives not to make things public. And so they are, you're often not going to find things, you know, in your, uh, in your, in your full text record, you have to go out and, um, and do interviews. Um, and I think to, to go to Jackie's point um, about description, uh, you know, there's this interesting piece that um, Evan Lieberman had a few years ago about the biomedical research model as a possible model for political science, right? And he sort of points out that, you know, in medical journals, um, there are, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a chunk of, of work that is, hey, I saw this thing and no one's really described it and it's really kind of interesting. Right, and that we don't necessarily have as much of that as we should in the social sciences, and we might want to think of, about, you know, a, a role for description or for um, for descriptive inference. I think all of those things can be ways that one can sort of um, make an argument that one's qualitative methods are um, are important and are often the only way to get at um, at a question. Um, with respect to your question about kind of big projects and how to how to survive them and how to break them up and how to keep it going, Abe. Um, you know, we all we, we all have different personalities um, and we all sort of figure out what works best uh, for us as this back and forth with uh, with James and, uh, and Jackie shows. Um, but, you know, I, I think often sort of um, taking your work out and engaging with others and kind of getting energy from talking collectively about your work, not only when it's done, but also when it's in progress uh, can be really important. And obviously that's one of the difficulties of this um, of this pandemic. Uh, but even now, you know, we can't engage in person, we can engage on Twitter, we can engage on Zoom. Uh, and I think that is a sort of way of kind of getting re-energized, right? Kind of going and like, you know, just not always sitting and thinking about your archival notes, right? But actually getting out and talking to whether it's your advisors in grad school or it's your classmates or it's your colleagues or any other um, audience. Um, I would also argue that, uh, that there is value to a kind of diversification strategy, which is to say, um, maybe not putting all of your eggs into the book basket, uh, in part because that book can take such a, such a long time uh, to, um, to see the light of day, um, but also because more practically, um, you know, if something hangs up the, the finishing of that book manuscript or its publication, uh, you wanna have other things there on your, um, on your, on your CV. And so that also then gets to, well, can you pull apart pieces where it's uh, presenting your theory and a single case? Can you pull apart a single case? Can you pull apart kind of one idea? I would say, and I know there's at least one press editor on this call, I would say you, you don't wanna completely cannibalize the book, right? That is, you don't wanna sort of publish all the articles and then all you have left in the book is just like you stapled them together, right? You wanna be able to make an argument to uh, book editors that what you've got in the book is unique and people are gonna be willing to read the whole book and not just read the articles. Um, but I do think it's okay to have some overlap. And it, again, I think is a way of kind of keeping yourself going. The last thing I would say is that, um, you know, you're, we also, I think, need to realize that, that people have lives that are not just about their research and their jobs. And so sometimes one is at a point in one's life where um, there's lots of time to go somewhere and do interviews or to go sit in an archive. Uh, and other times, either because of one's teaching obligations or because of one's sort of family life, uh, that's not the place to, to, to do, there's not the time for it, right? And so you can think about, you know, what, what are the kinds of, of work on a project that can be done uh, in certain periods when you can, you know, be in the archive every day versus in other periods where 
you're back at home uh, and you have, you know, maybe only a couple of hours here and there to do things, right? And so we're thinking about that a, that a big project like a book has lots of different pieces to do and sort of figuring out like how to, how to you know, which pieces can be done at which point in time and to not feel bad about the fact that um, you don't always have the flexibility to go disappear for a year uh, off uh, working on your, on your project. Thanks. Great. Okay, we the, the chat is going off, which is exactly what we want. So I have a bunch of questions. Uh, I'm going to once again try to group them um, into a next kind of group of three uh, things. So um, the the first is it's kind of uh, it's going off of I think it's a conversation between Jackie and James in particular, which is. Um, the tension between striving for perfection and letting your ideas, uh, you know, um, breathe and putting things out there before they're perfect, and and I I I think this is a really difficult um, conversation or where to land. But I also think for people that are starting out in the perfect in the profession um, that it's important to not make them so scared that they have to be perfect to that they then don't put things out into the world. I had a very good friend who, you know, he started out and he thought like, well, the only way I'm gonna get tenure is if I land an IO and he was a qualitative method. And so, he, you know, he, he actually like landed some very strong things but he was so reluctant. He only had like two publications, you know, because the, and they were in, you know, the top journals, but it was anyway. So I think that's, that's like a one tension that I think it would be good to have that conversation. Um, the second is about um, publishing in top journals. And the, 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 the question in the chat is, you know, with the move to mix methods, you know, where, you know, it's like, you're supposed to do a survey and an observational thing and then have a case study. And, you know, like, can you really publish qualitative research in the top journals? Um, and I am a strong believer that you can. I mean, and, and people in this call have. And so, you know, I think it's important to give advice about how do you do that? Um, and what are, you know, how do you structure your piece to do that? And one of the things I would say is like, in my own view is like, you have to be self-aware about which intellectual nuggets can join the conversation in those top journals. It doesn't mean it's bad if it's not in that conversation. Like, so one of my most cited pieces is not in a, you know, top five journal. That doesn't mean I shouldn't put it out there, but at the same time, everybody wants to get into those top five journals. So how do you, how do you know when your thing is well-matched to that conversation? Um, and then the, the third uh, question is, I would call it, um, you know, breaking in to publishing, or it's your, your uh, kind of a recent PhD student, this is your first, you know, you're trying to publish your first thing. And what tips would you have Ch turning a conference paper into a publication or turning a piece of your dissertation, you haven't experienced this before. Um, and kind of what kind of practical advice could you give to that listener? Because now we're Terry Gross. A listener wants to know. Okay, now, okay, I'm, who am I gonna pick on first? I don't really remember. I think James went last or first last time. Um, I think Lena has gone first in a q and I think Jackie, it's your turn to go first. Is that, I think we're gonna go Lena, or sorry, Jackie, Lena, James. Okay, awesome. Okay, great questions and difficult, right? And I saw Signe's question too, Signe's question too, right? The same, what is the, what is the balance or trade-off between good enough for R&R &R and perfection, right? Um, I think this is like, I mean, we all, to, you get to this point because you're pretty driven, right? So I think at some level, you have to think that your good enough is still gonna be hopefully, right? Um, especially as you get, there's a, this is an iterative process too. We all get better at knowing what journals expect, right? So that the, that good enough is, is going to be better. But I mean, my sense is make, know yourself. But if you're someone who maybe veers towards perfection, um, I've certainly had that issue. <laughs> then pull back, right? That's my that's why I said like with the don't map for me not mapping all my writing out ahead of time. 
letting it go. I have the most productive colleagues I know are the ones who can just, I've written with them and they write and they just let it out and they don't worry about it not being perfect. And then they go back and they revise it until it looks good enough for an R and R. And then they get the feedback and they get it into something fantastic and they are massively productive. Um, and it's because they don't obsess, you know, and not every word is precious and has to be rewritten. And we could have a whole conversation about writing strategies. Cause to me, to me, that's really related to, to being happy about writing, not hating yourself, not hating every word, right? And letting it go. So I really think, you know, that that's also, it's also thinking about it in stages, right? Like getting it out, continuing writing. I mean, when I'm doing empirical work too, I, I always try to have, you know, notes where I'm just also thinking about what I'm writing so that the writing continues to flow. Um, but there's a time for, for polishing, right? Um, and that's it, but it is a, process in stages and you the first draft should should be you know I'm bilingual function of bilingual institution but about a joke mauvais brouillon a bad draft right you don't want a good draft you want a bad draft first of all and that is good that's good it gets it on the page so that would be so think of it in terms of stages um and this question about like journals and and hierarchy like I said you have to be aware of where you are in your career and where you know what the institutional pressures are, are on you and at certain moments that does matter but I agree it can be stifling right it can be it can kill your creativity if you're not careful if you're only trying to get in into a certain set of conversations because you have to do it in a certain way as Abe was saying so if you can if you need to do that and it doesn't hurt right then think of it you know that that's part of my research. As I was saying, thinking of projects as clusters. Okay, this is the version I think I could try to pitch into this journal or that journal, right? And these are the other pieces of it where I wanna have a conversation with other people, um, a range of different people. Uh, and I think that that would be my strategy for thinking about that rather than, again, trying to force everything into the mold. Because I also think it is constraining on thinking, but then I'm, I'm a more critical of the, you know, I'm, I see myself as being a more critical IPE person. And so if I always only could publish in those journals, I wouldn't do what I'm doing, right? So, but that, but I'm also, I was trained in the US, I like having those conversations. So I, you know, in that sense, I'm comfortable moving between those worlds. Um, but they are different, different ways of thinking, different ways of writing. That would be one, one strategy, I guess. But again, I have tenure, right? So you have to be realistic about where you are in your life. Okay. Um, so with, with respect to, to Abe's question about sort of um, just starting out and sort of being new to this and, and, and getting work out, I would say that um, it's, it's really important uh, when you're ready to send a paper out uh, that your voice and your argument are front and center. And I think that this is sometimes uh, difficult when you're starting out, um, not least because uh, you know one spends a lot of time in graduate school taught to find all the flaws in everything, right? And then it's like, I'm gonna say, this is my argument, but come on, they're gonna come at me immediately. Um, and I think it's also because you know often in the dissertation process, there's this kind of need or this perceived need to demonstrate that you know the literature, right? And that you've kind of like situated your project in, in this whole, you know, hey, everyone, I read all this stuff, I promise, let me tell you all about it, um, which, which, is, which is fine um, at the, uh, in the early stages. Uh, but when you get to that point of submission, um, your readers and your reviewers need to know what the argument, what the central contribution is, right? And they're not gonna get to the point of appreciating your super awesome qualitative evidence if they're not on board with the with the front end and they really can't sort of figure out in the first you know in the first few pages right what's the argument what's the contribution like what's your voice i think this is sometimes gendered but not always right and so getting your voice out there is is is, is important um many of us i think also kind of think i do this I, I think while i write i'm kind of figuring out the argument as i'm drafting but that means i need to go back and and sort of remove some of that and make sure that it's it's clear what the um what the claim is and this is, you know, a, a place where you can ask your um, your colleagues and your and your friends and people you ask to sort of look at your work before you send it out. You know, what do you see as the contribution? What do you think this paper is about? That can often be very very useful feedback uh, to to get. So I would suggest again, kind of sharing work uh, before uh, the, uh, the 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 decision to send it out for review. Um, the other strategy that that folks who are um, early in their careers will sometimes find helpful is um, is co-authoring. Right, so uh, whether the work is qualitative or, or otherwise, um, it's often really useful to get mentorship in the in the context of co-authoring, right? To kind of figure out how that process works by going through it with someone who's who's been there, uh, who's been there before. Um, 
With regard to publishing in um, in the in the in the quote unquote top journals, um, you know, I, I would say as as Abe points out, yes, there is qualitative work that makes it through the review process, so we know it's not impossible. Um, I would also say that the rates of acceptance for all kinds of work in those journals are ridiculously low, right? So if we look at the number of submissions, you know, AJPS, I think, gets 1,200 submissions a year. International organization is about, is about, about 550 a year. Um, and so if you think then about the number of things that actually make it through, it's really small, right? And so I think that's a, that, so it's not necessarily that it's hard to publish qualitative work in those journals. I think it is in some, some ways, uh, but it's hard to publish any kinds of work in those, in those journals. Um, and it kind of gets to this point that Jackie made that um, there are certainly incentives to aim high uh, for in, in some situations, um, but there also are a lot of other places to aim, right? And there's and, and sort of figuring out kind of what how to pitch work is uh, is useful. Um, but again, I would say that you know if you if you've got a theoretically, uh, I think that many of those um, journals that that uh, that the role mentioned in the question, you know, they they want there to be a theoretically innovative argument, right? And they want there to be some empirical evidence, right? And, or they want there to be a formal model and some empirical evidence, or that you know, like you have to have the things that that are expected there. Um, and if instead it's a piece where the the, the empirical thing is very, very cool, but there's not necessarily the theoretical thing to go with it, that is going to be probably more challenging to put in um, one of those places. So I think it's also, again, not to kind of go back too much to this, but asking people who have more experience, um, not only, you know, what do you see as the contribution of this piece, but also where do you think I should send this, right? So people who've done this before, um, we, you know, you, we, when you get old, uh, you maybe don't get as much work done, but you have lots of ideas about how to tell people what they should do. So rely on those people to get, uh, to get advice. All right, well, more fantastic questions. This is a, a really interesting discussion. I'm, I'm learning a lot uh, about these, uh, my fellow panelists and um, these uh, scholars who I admire and have long admired. Um, I think one of the things that's neat is that we have different sorts of scholars and different sorts of approaches. We all do qualitative methods, but we, we work on different topics, obviously, and also take different approaches. And one of the things that it, it's maybe sometimes people think I'm a, a little bit silly when I say this, but I actually think IPE is very diverse in, in, in ways. And certainly it feels more diverse in some of the conventional senses than the field of security and the you know, security groups that I've sometimes seen. So I like that about the field very much. And I think that intellectually we're more diverse than people sometimes believe and understand as well. And uh, I want to try to personally nurture that diversity and to see it advanced. So there are kind of uh, three things I'll, I'll say in response to these questions. The, the first one is the world needs all types. The field needs all types. And we're hooked up in different ways. We have different experiences. There are different six, you know, paths to success. And so the, I, I don't, you know, a recipe for unhappiness is to try to want people to want things they don't want to want. Instead, it's better to try to help people find paths to achieving their potential, their, their desires. And so if you're the type of person who needs to think out loud and write things down and submit them and share them with others and get feedback in an iterative process, Boy, oh boy, does the world need people like that in the field doing that kind of work. On the other hand, if you know, you're an Emily Dickinson type and you want to spend a little more time cloistered, uh, deep in thought, doing that kind of thing, you know, the world needs that kind of uh, approach as well. And so I hope that, and I think that panels nicely assemble, very nicely assembled in this sense, that there are different models, there are different paths to success. And so one hopes that it will be possible to um, for everybody to sort of say, oh, I want to be a little bit like Jackie in this regard, or a little bit like Lena in this regard, and maybe I want to borrow from James in, in, in that regard. Um, okay, so know yourself, find the best version, and then think quite consciously about the advantages and disadvantages, the challenges and opportunities. What kind of scholar do you want to be? You want to be like this kind of person, you want to be like that kind of person. Okay, the second point is about the journals and, and the hierarchy. And you might remember one of my first comments was to try to steer people, encourage people not to think too much about the outlet 
for one of the reasons is exactly what Abe said, which is sometimes the work that really moves me, that I find exciting, that I find to be really good is not necessarily in the best journals. And um, if we all focus on doing our best work and finding the right outlet for it, then sure, sometimes stuff that's in the top journals is really good, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes the cool, innovative work is not in the top journals precisely because it's so innovative, it's so new, they don't have a reviewer pool, there's a bias against it and so on. So I am a, a person who tries to think about the outlet second and think about the work on its, on its own terms. And maybe that's naive. It probably is naive. Um, maybe I need to you know, deal more with deans and, and things like that. But I think if we as a community can try to remember that, bear that in mind and give each other's work a chance, regardless of the outlet it comes in and come to our own independent conclusions, I think we'll all be better served. And I think the field will be a better place. Okay, the third point is, is what can one do as a junior scholar? I'll tell you one of the things that, that we did as junior scholars, I and a group of, of similar scholars. This was way before Zoom existed. We were all a little bit isolated in different places. I started at Middlebury, which was wonderful, but there, what, it's not like being in New York or Boston or London where there's, you know, you can't throw a stone without running into, you know, hitting somebody who you can talk to about your research. You know, it's a, it's a liberal arts college in the middle of Vermont, and I had wonderful conversations there, but there were only a handful of IPE people. And I've missed the experience of going to a place like Ipes where you have hundreds of IPE people. So a number of us got together, all assistant professors and PhD students, and we invested like hell in each other in our projects. I probably shouldn't say that. We invested like heck in each other and our projects. It wasn't getting the biggest names in the field. It was a group of people who committed to each other to we did totally different kinds of work, but we got very good work done. Some of the best work of my career, some other colleagues um, have done very, very well. And some of their best work has come through this because we read iterated drafts and a little bit like, like Jacqueline said, we would send it out, we would tear it apart. And it was actually a lesson I learned a, a little bit from, from Lena and a couple other people in IPE. You can be hard on a scholar on their work, and you can be even harder if you know that that person cares about you as a person. And because we cared about each other as people, we knew that it wasn't personal. We weren't trying to knock someone down and make them feel bad. We were able to really give incisive criticism, feedback. And our names, I'm very proud of my name being in the acknowledgments of some really good work in the field because I know that, that I was there. And I'm, I'm very grateful to a couple of people who really helped me, and particularly some of my early work, break into the field as it were in that sense. Wonderful. Um, so I want to just pull out a few threads that came that struck me in particular. Um, I think what James just talked about at, uh, um, at the end of his comments, I think is so important about, you know, there's this bigger intellectual community out there. You know, there's a world of political science or sociology or whatever you're in, but then you really need to find a group that you feel comfortable with sharing your work. And it could be at your university, it could be in a network, it could be something that you just meet somebody at a conference um, and you start to engage with them. Uh, one of my co-authors, Henry Farrell, you know, like we had a beer in Germany when I was doing pre-dissertation work. It was so random, you know what I mean? But it just like was like, oh yeah, we understand each other. And, and I think one of the things that's really important is opening yourself up to not see it as competition, but seeing it as uh, a community. Because you know it would have been very easy for me to say, oh, there's this guy, Henry Farrell, and he's working on privacy, and I'm working on privacy, and I hate him, and he's going to ruin me. You know, but instead, you say, like, actually, you know, that's the point. We're supposed to be in a debate. We're supposed to communicate with each other. And through that conversation, we're going to open up some new ideas. And, and so I just would encourage people to to, to move in that direction, because I think that's how the community learns uh, from each other. Um, the second thing I want to underscore is something that um, Lena said, which I, I had an advisor who, he said, when you are done at your conference with your conference paper or your dissertation, you have to, you have to transform your paper from what he called, and I think it's, it's like the logic of discovery to the logic of presentation. So 
you discovered something, you read a lot of books about stuff and you like were in the archives and you did all these interviews and you wrote it up like about how you found it. You know, it was like this piece and then that piece. And, but then you have to transform that thing into something where you're presenting it to an audience, where you're teaching them what you actually, the big idea. And it's no longer proving that you discovered something along the way, but it's about the, the kind of the, the headline features. And I always also, you know, I talk about how like my mom uh, explains a movie, you know, where she's like, she does the logic of, pre of discovery where it's like, well, there's this car and it's driving on a highway and then it swerves off the highway because there's a deer and then it crashes in the woods. And like, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, it was the movie Misery, you know, like, which really you should explain as it's a movie about an obsessive fan who like stalks their author. That's the logic of presentation. And that's kind of how we have to think about transforming our, our papers because we often write them initially in the logic of um, discovery. The, the, uh, just two quick more points. One is, is that um, for new, be, new people in the profession, um, I just, I wanna encourage you to feel the excitement as what my father calls um, arousal, which is like, you're, you're a little nervous, but it's because you're aware that this is a new experience and not as fear. And um, one of my very best friends in uh, graduate school got a, a letter back from an international organization after submitting the article to, you know, for review. And, and the letter started, you know, dear so-and-so, I regret to inform you, you know, blah, 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 blah. And that person put that away. And like, it was like, whatever. A year later, he got another email from international organization, which is like, your window to revise your, your piece, you know, is now ending. Are you interested in revising your piece? And it was one of those things where every letter from international organization starts with, we regret to inform you because it didn't get accepted. But then they say, you know, we regret to inform you, we could not accept your piece at this time, but we are offering you a revise and resubmit. And, you know, it was, it's, when I am working with graduate students, it's so often the case that just submitting the thing is nervous making. You know, just opening the manuscript central is 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 like, did I do it right? Did it really get, you know, is it all? And so just believe in yourself that like, this is a process where they want to engage with you and you don't need to fear it, You but you are a little bit excited. The last thing I just wanna say is about framing your nugget for a big impact journal. And the, the uh, Jim Vreeland, who was at Georgetown, boo, Jim Vreeland, boo, Princeton. Anyway, that's another boo. thing. Boo. Um, but he, he taught me this lesson, which I thought was so important, um, was you can have the most obscure fact in the world, but if you pitched it in a way to a broad audience, you can land in the most prestigious journal. And his example of this is Beth Simmons's article um, from 2000, uh, it's an APSR, and it's about um, compliance, state compliance with international law. And it's like, it redefined the field. It was like a huge impact thing. If you go into that article and you ask yourself, what's actually this empirically about? Well, it's about article eight, section two of the IMF treaty. And if you were like, Gosh, what is even Article 8 section? That's an four? awesome part of the treaty. Come oh, on, okay. current account okay. convertibility, Abe. Okay, okay, okay. But it's like, it, it was a cross-disciplinary, this piece had such a wide impact because it opened up a whole new research terrain and really redefined what people could, ask, the questions people could ask. You could write that same paper about, you know, IMF, I don't know, whatever. And it would not be in that same journal at that same level. And so it's really, it's, you know, it's thinking about, uh oh, I'm getting all the IMF haters now. They're like, you don't even know the IMF. Okay. I agree. It's a really important thing. But for me, I, that was the lesson I took was that it's all about thinking about how you can join the conversation with your obscure or not obscure nugget, as the case may be, uh, into that world. Okay. Okay. We, we only have seven more minutes, but I still have a lot of good questions in the chat. And so I'm going to throw them at you uh, for probably one last round, I'm thinking, but there might be, I don't know, we'll see how long people take. The first question is about 
the post-publication plan and what you do with your qualitative research after it's been accepted. And I think one of the struggles is, is that you cannot just write that tweet that says uh, something causes a 50% increase in blah, blah, you know, which a lot of other scholars, they might just do that kind of, that kind of point. Um, the second is strategies that people have found in the virtual environment when a lot of traditional qualitative research um, activities, especially visiting archives, has been more difficult. Um, what they, you know, what, what can you do? There's a call for recommendations for your favorite book or article in qualitative IPE research. And, and one of the things I think is, is it important because I think these are templates that will help people publish their own work. And so maybe you like the argument, but I also think if you just like the way it was, it was laid out is really important. Um, another question is about how do you get to know uh, an intellectual community if you're interested in that intellectual community? And I think that it's there's kind of a, a somebody starting out in their career. And then there's um, a final question, which I don't think, I think it's hopeless. But can we get economists to write books? And I don't know, I'm worried because their profession does not encourage them to do that. But if you had any suggestions of how could you um, elicit them to do that? Okay, uh, I am now turning over these questions to my group. And I think I'm, gosh, I just forgot who went first. Jackie went first that time. So I'm going to put James back in the spotlight, and then Lena, and then Jackie last. Oh, James, you're on mute. Thank you so much. I apologize. Uh, these are, again, great questions. I have one quick follow-up from what Abe said as, as I listened to you. I understand that we are asking people to go out on a limb. And, and trust in the process and so on. One of the key things to remember is that your fellow IPE people are likely reviewers for the top journals who wanna see more IPE work in the top journals. And so your story, Abe, about Henry, I've heard this a hundred times from other scholars as well. The people you, who are doing closely related, related work to you are some of your biggest allies, biggest advocates. They will push you and challenge you. They become like your family if you open yourself up in that way. But like Jackie says, there are a lot of tears and we all have been there as well. So I don't wanna sugarcoat that, but please, please, please do uh, try. I, I guess I don't have a, a wonderful things to say about these, these things. I think the, the, how to do your work in these difficult times is really hard. I certainly haven't figured it out. This is part of the seasonality that I discussed. So I've done a lot of non-archival work, some kind of theory work, theory building, literature review work for my next project. Uh, that's one thing. Another thing is a little bit like Lena said, I've faced these kinds of things in the past with, you know, familial illness and children and, and, and the rest of life and so on. And so I've uh, come to appreciate that you have to take advantage of the time you have it. So I've done some more organizing and analyzing of the stuff I already have. And uh, I'm also trying to work up new leads. So I'm trying to get some personal papers from uh, one of the governors, the descendants of one of the governors of the Bank of England, which I would try to get anyway, but that's more promising now because the Bank of England's been closed. The archives have been closed you know, for, for more than a year and are gonna be closed for some months to come. So trying to shake new trees is sort of the last piece of advice on, on that. In terms of really great qualitative work, one of the books that, I absolutely love is John Eikenberry's After Victory. And it's an older book now, but it just really does a great job of walking through not just each case, but connecting the cases together in a grand arc. And so I've, I've tried to emulate that in uh, my own book to a certain extent. And I really admire that. Something that's a lot more recent and really good is Adam Dean's book. Uh, which is on labor politics. Lena, of course, knows it very well. Um, others perhaps do as well, and Dean at George Washington. It is really good at using archival evidence uh, to make the case 
for um, profit sharing institutions. And so I often recommend that students will take a look at that as very recent, very good work that it has mixed methods, but he does a great job on the archival side as far as I can tell. Great, thanks, uh, James. I think Lane is next and we have two minutes left and I know that our uh, panelists need to leave on time. So I'm gonna give you each a minute. Okay, um, Julia Morris has a book coming out and some articles as well on the anti-money laundering uh, regime and it's cool. Okay, uh, two, uh, post-publication, um, you, you can tweet about your uh, your article and you know, I turns out that tweets get more uptake if they have images and GIFs and so it could be like a screen grab for an archive or something funny or whatever. Uh, if you identify as a woman, you can also tag women also know stuff. They love publicizing the work uh, of, uh, of women uh, scholars in political science and IR. And you can also email those folks who gave you comments along the way to let them know that your article is out. And you could also email people more broadly. You don't want to spam people, but many of us don't read every journal table of contents. And so we're interested to know when there's new and exciting qualitative work in uh, in our areas. And last thing, um, you know, in terms of building a community, um, ask your friends or your mentors to introduce you to people that you think you might have an overlap with. Um, I, you know, I, I, I met Kate a long, long time ago when my office mate in grad school who was a couple of years older than I was, figured out that we had some things in common. And that was long ago, but it was awesome. And so those kinds of um, personal connections can really be great. Don't be afraid to ask people to put you in touch with people. Jackie. Okay, great suggestions there. Yeah, I mean, I also said this, I think a good supervisor, Mark Belive was my supervisor. I was his first PhD student, but he put me in contact with Kate, with Eric Kalina, with Jonathan Kirshner, and my thesis became the first book in their series. It was amazing, right? And Kate is still very much like a mentor. So I think that's that was about putting, you know, putting people putting people together. And beyond that, a lot of it, I think, is happenstance, right? And we happily Zoom makes some of these things a little easier. Um, and and just one, I would just make one point on the post publication. And that is one thing I've learned is that I, I like doing a bit of popular work, popular writing. I used to think of it as zero sum. Um, but I think as long as you discipline it, right, because it can, it can take away, but if you, as long as you discipline it, it's not zero sum, because if you can write about the, your, your work in blogs, in op-eds, and link it to contemporary events, you're, you're actually getting your idea, you're writing better, <laughs> because you have to actually communicate with the general audience, and, um, and, and you get it out there. So I think that's also something to, to think about, is there's the tweet side of things, but there's that sort of mid-length piece, pitching different audiences, um, and I think that can be a fun thing. And in terms of favorite, I just love, I love, I do love Erica Liner's work for the kind of connection of a contemporary problem with history and hi historicizing. And I think he does it beautifully. So just put that pitch in with another little, a little bit of Canadian content there. Wonderful. Um, I want to just thank everyone again. I'm putting in the chat a link to the event series that we did this year on race in the international political economy. We had a lot of great uh, scholars that joined us. Those videos are up on the web. Um, and I just want to encourage everybody to, you know, to, to join these conversations on how qualitative methods can be used in uh, political economy. You're not alone. <laughs> Other people are doing it. And, you know, people are, we're, we're here. And if you want to ping us and you have questions, you know, please follow up. So thanks again to our panelists. Uh, for the great conversation and thanks everybody for joining us today um, and good luck in your work. Bye everybody.